Sometimes a weapon is produced that no one can ignore. Something so much better than anything else on the market that it becomes the de facto standard. Winnipeg, Manitoba's Bristol Aerospace created such a weapon in the early 1970s. It combined high speed and long range with a powerful knockout punch. It was the CRV-7 rocket, and it would eventually become ubiquitous among Western Aligned Armed Forces. At the end of the 1960s, Canada was changing its role within NATO. It would give up its nuclear strike role in favor of conventional strike and close air support. However, these missions would have to be flown using the existing CF-104 Starfighter fleet. This revised mission was exceptionally dangerous for a few reasons. First, the Starfighter was really fast, making low-level attacks very challenging. Second, it had to contend with short-range ground-based air defenses. Check out my video about the CF-104 for more information. It was clear to the RCAF that they needed a weapon with a long enough standoff range to keep the aircraft outside of the reach of these systems, along with the striking power to destroy whatever it hit. Enter the Canadian Rocket Vehicle 7, or CRV-7. The CRV-7 is an evolution of the 70mm folding fin aerial rockets, also known as Mighty Mouse. The RCAF had been using them since the CF-100 Canuck Mark IV entered production in 1952. Check out my video about the first generation air-to-air -air missiles, or the one I made about the CF-100 for more detailed information about their design, development, and context. These rockets were designed for the air-to-air -air role, but were easily converted to ground attack. In fact, it was found that a volley of rockets could achieve greater destructive potential with less weight and recoil than a heavy autocannon. The FFAR Mark 40 variant was widely used in the Korean War and the Vietnam War in the close air support role. This proved that the standoff rocket attack concept was viable, but further development was required before it would fulfill Canada's needs. In the early 1970s, the Americans began work on the Hydra 70 rocket system, while Canada initiated the CRV-7 program. To equip the CF-104s, the RCAF was looking for something with greater range, speed, and destructive power than anything else on the market. For this, they turned to CARD, that's the Canadian Armament Research and Development Establishment. They'd been working on anti-ballistic missile systems and had developed high-performance solid-fuel rocket motors in collaboration with Aerojet. This research led to the highly successful Black Brant sounding rocket series. Check out my video about the Black Brant for its complete history. Their experience allowed the program to move from concept to actual design. CARD then handed over control of the program to Bristol Aerospace of Winnipeg, Manitoba. There, Jose Thorell would head the weapons development. The CRV-7 was made up of three components. The rocket motor, the warhead, and the launch tube. It was decided that the new weapon should be compatible with existing 70mm launchers for simplicity and to save on service life costs. Bristol then focused their efforts on the rocket motors. When a Mighty Mouse leaves its launch tube, it takes time for its fold-out fins to provide the rotation necessary for gyroscopic stability. This means that for the first few seconds of flight, the rockets are unstable and thus lose accuracy and cause greater dispersion. To solve this problem while still using existing launch tubes, Bristol decided to modify the exhaust cone of the rocket with spin-inducing vanes. This allowed the CRV-7 to begin spinning up as soon as the rocket motor was ignited, even before it leaves the tube. This feature greatly improved accuracy, but comes at a slight cost in thrust. However, this loss was easily overcome using CARD's high-energy propellant. The propellant also had the benefits of being able to be stored and operated in temperatures ranging from minus 54 degrees Celsius to plus 71. This meant that it would be good to go pretty much anywhere. The new CRV-7 rocket motors had a greater range, higher speed, and a much flatter flight path than the 70mm FFRAs they were replacing. The first came out in 1973 and was called the C-14. It produced an impulse of 10.3 kilonewton seconds with a burn time of 2.2 seconds. Trouble was that it produced a lot of smoke due to the use of an aluminum additive. This was corrected in the C-15 at a cost of some thrust. The ignition system was also changed. Originally, they were ignited by a plug that was ejected by the rocket exhaust. 
However, this could result in damage to the aircraft, and so a permanent side igniter was developed. It was equipped with three pop-out fins wrapped around the end of the motor for aerodynamic stability. This replaced the four rear-mounted folding fins found on the FFAR. The C-15 remained the standard motor for fixed-winged aircraft throughout the lifetime of the system. Helicopters firing the CRV-7 would still often find themselves blinded by their own smoke. To address this, a completely smokeless motor was developed, the C-17, but its impulse was further reduced to 8.5 kilonewton seconds. The C-17 remained the standard motor for rotary wing aircraft. The last piece of the puzzle was the warhead. The RCAF was looking to poke holes in tanks and hardened aircraft shelters and needed a suitable penetrator. The first warhead fitted was the US M151 high explosive point detonating round with a 4.5 kg high explosive payload. It could also be equipped with the M156 smoke or M278 flare rounds. They were the same warheads found on late model Mark 40 FFARs. Bristol created their own practice round that simulated the ballistics of the M151 called the WTO5001. It had a 3.6 kg steel rod in place of the explosives. Testing found that these rounds had considerable penetration power against hard targets and could achieve so-called kinetic kills. Centurion tanks that were being used as practice targets were easily penetrated by the round. Later, a hardened steel rod was used to increase the penetration power. Designers at Bristol got to work building off that success by creating the WDU-5002 Flechette Anti-Tank Round. This 7.3 kg semi-armor-piercing high-explosive incendiary round was designed for use against tanks and hardened aircraft shelters. The single hardened steel rod was replaced with five smaller ones, each containing 75 grams of incendiary material. The rods could penetrate NATO standard heavy triple armor at angles of obliquity up to 40 degrees. Alternatively, each could also penetrate 4 meters of earth, 91 centimeters of concrete, and 25 millimeters of steel in series. Pretty impressive performance owed largely to the rocket's high impact speed. The WDU-500XB General Purpose Flechette Warhead was a soft target round based on the 5002. It contained 80 smaller flechettes. These were used in the anti-personnel role or against lightly armored targets thanks to the tiny rod's ability to penetrate 38 millimeters of steel. The Norwegian company Raufos Ammunitionsfabriker produced the RA-70 and RA-79 semi-armor-piercing warheads for the CRV-7. They were designed for the anti-shipping role and featured a time-delay fuse. The CRV-7 entered service with the Canadian Armed Forces in 1974. The first platform to use them was the CF-104 Starfighter. Just as intended, the highly accurate rockets were used in the tactical strike role against targets like artillery emplacements, tanks, bunkers, and hardened aircraft shelters. The range and speed of the rockets kept the Starfighter safely outside the range of anti-aircraft systems during the strike. The 104s could carry two pods under each wing, totaling 76 rockets. When the CF-5 entered service in 1968, it too would be equipped with the rockets as one of its primary weapon systems. They could carry a total of 38 rockets and two underwing pods. Check out my video about the CF-5 for more information. The ultimate CRV-7 platform deployed by Canada was the CF-18. Entering service in 1983, it could carry 76 rockets and 4 underwing pods, although it is possible to carry more if pushed. This gave the Hornets a strong punch, and combined with their speed and agility, make them a formidable ground attack platform. Testing with the CF-18 found that the rockets had a dispersion of only 3 milliradians. Bristol had been boastfully promoting the CRV as having a dispersion of 4 milliradians. Either way, the rockets were much more accurate than the CF-18's own GAU-8 Avenger gun, which had a dispersion of 5 milliradians. The Land Force's CH-136 Kiowa was also able to deploy the CRV-7 in the fire support role. Although not common for the platform, it was able to carry 6 to 10 rockets mounted in single or multi-tube pods. 
The CRV-7 also served with 14 other nations, including the UK, Germany, Norway, France, and South Africa. Even the United States uses them. In fact, they're so popular that the CRV was considered the de facto standard ground attack rocket in the Western world. As such, it was also qualified and fired from over 40 other fixed and rotary wing platforms, including Jaguar, Harrier, Hawk, the L-159, A-10, F-16, Alpha Jet, A-4 Skyhawk, Apache, UH-1H, Super Lynx 300, and the Riovac. CRV-7s launched from these platforms have been used in conflicts all over the world. Many of these countries continue to use the rocket in frontline service. So how does it compare with other 70mm systems? Well, the Hydras are lighter, so you can take a few more of them with you. Other than that, the CRV wins in pretty much every category. The heavier CRV has a more powerful rocket motor and so flies faster than the Hydra. The stabilization system is better in the CRV, so it has a flatter trajectory and a smaller dispersion rate, i.e. it's more accurate. It's no wonder the rocket is so popular. An enhanced precision guided version called the CVR-7PG was developed in 2006. This basically turns them into guided missiles comparable to systems like Maverick or Hellfire, but at a much lower cost. It was a joint development between Bristol, now called Magellan Aerospace, and Norway's Kongsberg Defense and Aerospace. The precision guided kits for a standard CRV sit between the rocket motor and the warhead. It includes an inertial navigation system for mid-course correction, as well as a laser homing seeker for the terminal phase. Anti-radiation and GPS seekers were also developed. A ground launch version was developed as a cheaper way to provide direct fire support. However, customers for the system were few and far between, and the whole PG system has been largely abandoned. The United Kingdom's BAE Systems APKWS Laser Guidance Kit was developed at the same time as the PG. The kit provides laser guidance for 70mm rocket systems like Hydra and the CRV-7, and works in pretty much the same way as the PG version. 37,000 kits have been made so far, with the US and the UK seeming to have adopted the system. Defense Research and Development Canada began a program to develop a replacement for the CRV in the 2000s, with both ground and air launch variants. Their main aim was giving light armored units a way to take out main battle tanks. They proposed the High Energy Missile, or HEMI. It builds on the CRV's tradition of kinetic kills, but takes it even further by increasing the speed. Unfortunately, programs like this tend to be kind of secretive, and so I couldn't find any updates about it. The CRV-7s were all withdrawn from Canadian service by 2007 and sent into storage. They had been superseded in the precision strike role by newer weapons like the JDAM GPS bomb, JSAO glide bombs, and largely, the Paveway laser guided bomb. In 2001, what was left of the stock at CFAD Dundurn was officially destined for disposal. A tender was issued, and the remaining 83,000 rocket motors and warheads are to be destroyed by 2027. With this action, the story of the CRV-7 in Canadian service came to an end. I'd like to thank my Patreons for all their support, especially the co-pilots. And don't forget to like and subscribe. It really helps the channel.